So, what was your first uh, uh, bidding with a, with a magnetic mallet? Uh, well, your first case, uh, you remember it? It's a while ago, yes, but I, I kind of remember it was a internal sinus lift. And uh, I mean, a regular internal sinus lift, about 4, 4.5 millimeters crestal bone was remaining. And uh, it worked. I mean, it was very easy to do it. Uh, but the good part that I saw, which was, which was really interesting to see, was uh, that I actually transposed the bone to the new floor, and I did not have to do a graft. Okay. So it was like making um, a distraction of the floor and raising it up to a certain level. And when I took the post-operative CT, and I saw that, I said, no, oh, this is the new floor. I have actually raised the new floor uh, without doing a bone graft. So I'm using the patient's host bone, and it's free. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. And it, it takes hardly a couple of minutes to achieve that. Uh, that was uh, the first case. And I, I think the same day, I did two or three cases. And uh, I really got a good feel of, of the instrument. And I said, I'm not going back to my piezo again. So the, the first time you used the mallet, it was all that. <laughs> yes, on the first day that I used it. You were natural. You were natural for the magnetic mallet. I think, I think it's, it's just something that fit in my hand very well. And uh, I would say now it is just like uh, nature to me because it is always ready. I just have to plug and play it. And uh, I use it. Um, sometimes in combinations with the drills, I, um, sometimes in combination with the extraction. So it's it's something that is always there as an assisting tool for me. And uh, for the maxilla, of course, uh, less and less drills and more and more mallet. This is the standard protocol in my practice now. And it works, it seems to be working wonderfully well. How do you introduce it to the patients, uh, explaining uh, the benefits, uh, explaining uh, what would have happened uh, if you didn't have this technology? What, what's your style? So uh, I think it's a combination of two or three things. The first thing, yes, we have to tell them the new technology. We have to explain and I, I tell them all the time that, okay, this is something which will give you less post-operative discomfort. Um, I also try to explain them uh, uh, if I use alternates, which are conventional techniques, what kind of uh, disadvantages we have and what we extra procedures we have to do. Uh, one thing that I always do, and I think uh, this is just a suggestion, I take the mallet and I put it on patient's shoulder with a fist and I just switch it on the foot switch so that they know what to expect. Okay. Because they are not expecting a sound, uh, even though it is a very small sound, like a click coming. Uh, when it is near and it's posterior maxilla is very close to your ear. So it's something that they, I program them to that sound and that vibration. And as I tell them, this is what you're going to feel. And most of them don't bother after that point in time. Oh, this is fine. Yeah, that's, that's a very good way. One of the most used way to prepare the patient. Yes. To something that is not so uh, dramatic, uh, but still. Yeah, and I just tell it them. It increases the experience. It increases and it gets them prepared for the unexpected. So in anticipation of the unanticipated. Yes, <laughs> I like that. If you like to, if you like to call that. <laughs> uh, a more clinical, technical question. Uh, how do you approach the use of the magnetic mallet uh, with uh, the bone condensation, meaning uh, are you afraid of over-condensing when you use the mallet? Uh, sometimes I am, and, and I will tell you my experience. Uh, it was last year in May, where I was, I think I over-condensed, and as I was inserting the implant, 
the implant driver broke. And that's not a good feeling when that happens. Okay. And uh, I don't blame any instrument and I think I don't blame any technology. I just thought that this is a poor quality implant driver and it was from a very reputed company. So I sent, and I have that video recorded because my assistant was recording it. And it's like, why did this happen? So I sent the uh, driver back. I was able to retrieve the driver and, you know, finish the procedure. It wasn't that big a deal because the implant was almost in. But analytically looking at it, I, I looked at uh, the torques that I was getting while I was inserting. and was, They were in excess of 70 newtons. Um, so sometimes now I use, as I said, combination. And especially, I think, true with the very active implants because they engage so much bone and uh, the bone implant contact is too high. Uh, so sometimes you need to use... Uh, your drills, and I would not use the drills for complete osteotomy. I would just go two or three or four millimeters, depending on the length of the osteotomy. But yes, over condensing can happen. It doesn't happen in every case. You just have this one case a year that it can happen. I've had it happen a second time where recently, uh, but now I'm being uh, careful in, in doing that because the force of the magnetic mallet will actually condense the bone and I feel as you are putting the implant and you're going one, two, three, four, five, seven, your torques are increasing in a very steady way. It's very important to see how you get your final torque value. If it is going from 15 newtons to say 40 newtons in two turns, then the stability is not that high. But if it is going from 15 to 20 to 22 to 20, and you can measure that when you see it on your on your dispenser, because your dispenser, yes, it is increasing. Now, I know that implant is solid. I know that that 35, 40 Newton value is actually a dynamic torque value where I can see the graph going up. And as an implantologist, I like to see that in all my cases. So, yes, bone management uh, is very important and um, it's just the tactile sensation that you get. And with experience, I know now when to use in combination with a drill and I'll just use a very slow speed just to create enough room for the implant to go and take its place in the osteotomy site. Uh, I would not do it for all cases, but if I do feel the resistance, I am not shy in, in using the drills because I want... I want the best result at the end of the day. Okay. That's... So, on a scale from one to five, where one is uh, very seldom and five is very often, uh, where do you place the use of the magnetic mallet for your extractions? Well, for the extraction, I would say I would use it in about 50% of my cases. Okay. I'm not using it for all my extraction cases. Uh, I should be using it more. But following the extraction, definitely, all the time. All the time. Especially in the maxilla, because I would say about 70 to 80 percent of my cases are immediate implant placement. And the numbers are increasing with the, the use of magnetic mallet, because it is just an extra procedure of one or two minutes that is required to place an implant in, in that extraction socket. It doesn't take too long. So for me, uh, using it post-extraction is stress-free. I call it stress-free implant placement because it is so straightforward. Okay. Uh, sometimes I need to make my uh, change my angulation, so I will use the first uh, uh, osteotomy site with the first uh, instrument. It is called the first, right, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Uh, so if I want to change the angle completely, that first helps me a lot. And uh, it's, it's just a wonderful experience to see that how you are actually transposing the bone and changing the angles to place your implant in a favorable site. Um, Post-extraction, uh, that uh, procedure is really making a difference. Uh. I think so for the patients too, not only for the dentist because uh, they don't have to go for another surgery. It's the same anesthesia in a few more minutes the implant placement is done. So I think it's it's a win-win situation for the dentist and the patient overall. 
and reducing the trauma is, I think, the key uh, for for both the dentist and the patient because your overall inflammation and pain control is just tremendous with the reduction of trauma. So when you first uh, started to use it, uh, you did uh, right away some very um, um, difficult cases. Uh, so on the upper side of the learning curve, uh, but uh, to a regular uh, user that wants to start, uh, want to try out the magnetic mallet, what type of case uh, would you suggest to approach first? So I think a person or a dentist who would use the magnetic mallet is already somebody who is placing implants. And I, I have this very strong belief that if you can do a wisdom tooth extraction mm. or a root extraction, you can place an implant. There is no rocket science to it. As long as your basic surgical principles are very sound, it is not difficult. It's not, uh, I mean, for simple cases, it's not really something that requires you to do hours and hours of extra training. Mm. And I think as an adjunct over there, to do post-extraction cases, I think magnetic mallet would be the best for the beginners. Mm -hmm. Then they can try their hand in removing roots, and they can try their hand in doing crest plates or sinus elevations. And um, it's a very fast learning curve. It's, it's not a slow learning curve. And uh, they, all the new users would definitely say, yeah, this was easy. And uh, we see that with so many people now. And uh, people call me and ask me, oh, can I use it for, for this purpose? I said, of course. Mm. You know, and it's not very damaging or not very traumatic. Every step is only one millimeter. So the control that you have on your osteotomy side Say for a 10 millimeter implant, you you have such a lot of control that you can do it five, six, seven, ten times and still have a controlled osteotomy. Okay. So that is the beauty. You can control your angles, you can control your placement. You want to move it a little palatal, just move the instrument a little palatal and then go another one millimeter. I'll tell you an example. Okay, so what happened was this is something on an upper second molar that I was doing recently, about two, three months ago. So it was an edentulous area. Extraction had been done um, maybe six weeks ago. And I started using the mallet in a straight direction. And I had the CT scan. And then when I took an intraoral x-ray, I said, the root of the distal root of the six is coming like this. And I said, how could I have missed it on the CT scan? because it looked very different on the CT scan, but when I put my depth gauge to see my angulation, I said, I am now going to hit this root. So what do I do? I changed my angle, I went two millimeters distal, and I changed my angle. Now I have an osteotomy site which was made only about two millimeters away okay. already. So it has been uh, already prepared to a depth of four or five millimeters. And I was thinking whether these two will meet and I will have a failure because I will have a larger osteotomy site. And then at the end of the preparation for a six millimeter uh, by eight millimeter implant, I could just see two sockets, one socket going this way and the initial going this way with a clear distinction of bone in between them, just like an interradicular septum for a, for a molar. And I was like, this is fantastic. I could have never achieved that with a drill because of the vibration and the softness of the bone. So I placed my implant in the right direction. I just augmented the first osteotomy. And after two months, I load and it's a beautiful result. And primary stability of, I got a 35 Newton torque on that. And initial primary stability of, um, if I remember, it was around 67 on an ISQ, which is great for for a upper second molar. Um, so I, I was very pleased with the result. And, and I said I could never achieve this with a drill, ever. 
You're describing such a beautiful surgery. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really a pleasure to listen. It is uh, the experience and it is just that, you know, simplest of the surgery can become complicated because of patient factors yeah. or, or a dentist factor. And we should have the technologies. See, a complication is a complication when you let it happen. If you can manage the complication, it's not a complication anymore. So from my point of view, this instrument is helping me to manage potential complications which can happen. And as I said earlier, stress-free. I am very, very relaxed when I'm using it because I know the time of contact of this instrument to the bone is limited. I know I will achieve my osteotomy faster than I can do the drilling. And I know it is going to be predictable each and every time. Each and every time it is going to be predictable. So I'm very happy from that point of view. Well, so here the bottom line is that we definitely have a technology that uh, is playing and will play more and more a major role in implantology. Okay. You were one of the pioneers that uh, um, believed in this uh, in uh, India and uh, is helping to give a lot of exposure, including with the podcast of uh, uh, today. Yes, right? thank you. <laughs> and um, as uh, we're planning to uh, start and run some educational programs here in India, we'll be very happy to have you be. I am I'm always there for science, as I told you earlier, for yeah. science and for training. If I, can, if I can train a few people and give them my experience, I, I would be very happy because it is, it is just a transfer of knowledge. And I, I believe in teaching every uh, person who wants to learn. So it's, it's always uh, a pleasure to do that. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, for Thank you, Claudio. And it's wonderful seeing you in India. Every time we meet, we have some interesting conversations. So thank, thank you. Thank you.